In this lesson on advanced network design, we're gonna start out with my favorite topic. Well, one of my favorite topics, not kidding. I love IEEE 802.1X PNAC, okay, Port-Based Network Access Control. It's like the holy grail of access control security at layer two. Now, .1X actually operates above 802.3 and .11. So that means you can operate in a wireless or a wired environment. And so often a company will start out with .1X in their wireless LAN, and then they'll transition and they'll expand it over to their ethernet, their wired LAN, or vice versa. And the goal of PNAC is to regulate access to the network and get closer to the endpoint as opposed to you know, the higher levels of the OSI model by trying to control what users can do you know, at layer five through seven or at, you know, using your directory service. We're pushing things down closer to the endpoint. And it's typically a good thing considering that so much damage can be done by a malicious threat agent who has access to a switch port, let's say in an empty cubicle or an office or a break room, the foyer, the foyer, however you want to pronounce that, conference rooms. Not to mention if they can get into the C team's office, the CEO or the CIO. So it guards against sending and receiving frames by unidentified or unauthorized parties. And it has to be a supporting switch. So the layer two or layer three switch does have to support dot one X. And if you look at the diagram here, let's kind of take a look uh, at the diagram. Let me give you a scenario uh, when I look at this diagram. Here we see the three parties of this architecture. Uh, over on the left-hand side is the supplicant. Now the supplicant is a couple of things. The supplicant is the end user, but it's also the device they're using and a software agent running on that device, so we call that a supplicant. And it could be a native supplicant. Uh, most operating systems like, you know, uh, Windows 10 has a native .1x supplicant, or it could be a third party supplicant. For example, Cisco has the Cisco AnyConnect Mobility Client, which is a .1x supplicant, very powerful. In the middle there, we have the authenticator, and that's gonna be a wired or a wireless, usually a layer two or layer two and layer three device. And that's the one that's accepting initially what we call EAPOL frames. Okay, so the supplicant, a couple of things are going to happen. Uh, that person, whether they're benign or malicious, is going to plug their laptop into, let's say, a port in an empty cubicle. Initially, what will happen is the supplicant will send an EAPOL, which is Extensible Authentication Protocol over LAN, okay, EAPOL. It'll send a start frame to the switch. Now, if the switch, which notices that somebody's on the port, doesn't get one of those frames, and it is a .1x authenticator, it's going to send a request ID. Okay, so one way or the other, the supplicant or the authenticator are going to try to get this party started, right? And so at that point, some credentials can be sent to the authenticator, then the authenticator will pass that back to an authentication server. And the language of love, typically between the authenticator and that backend authentication server is radius or diameter, okay? But we have other options. And the authentication server, by the way, in the diagram is just one box, but it can be an entire front-end, back-end cluster solution of authentication services. I mean, we can even leverage uh, Active Directory, for example, or other directory services. So the beauty, let me give you a scenario, okay? So let's say that I'm gonna go to a summit I'm gonna fly out to Boston, okay, for a corporate summit. And I'm gonna take with me three devices. I'm gonna take a laptop that was provisioned by my company. So, you know, it has an image on it and the image has a supplicant software built into it. And it could even be, you know, certificate based because with uh, .1x, we can use different variants of EAP. So maybe, for example, that provisioned device has a certificate. So I'm using EAP TLS or maybe I'm in a Microsoft environment and I'm using protected EAP, PEEP, or I could be using maybe, uh, in Cisco, we'll use EAP FAST, which uses a PAC, okay, a protected access credential file. So I've got lots of flexible options for advanced security on that provision device. So I've got that laptop, but I've also got, let's say this laptop, which is not provision, okay? So that's my own laptop. And it maybe has a supplicant on it, a native supplicant, but it's not really set up to send any credentials, okay? So 
it's got software, but it's not configured to get onto this .1x network. And then I have my iPad Air, okay? That has nothing, okay? It's a wireless device, but it has no supplicant at all. So I've got three different types of devices. So what could we do in this scenario with .1x? Well, if I find a cubicle and I plug in my provision laptop, well, it's gonna send EAPOL start frames, it's got a supplicant software, it's got a certificate, I'll go through the process and I'll use EAP TLS against the authentication server and I'm gonna get onto the corporate LAN and I'm gonna do everything I need to do, I'm on the corporate LAN as a device, you know, sign into Active Directory, so on and so forth. This laptop, which has a supplicant, but does not actually have any type of credentials, we can take that and put it into a guest VLAN, or let's say a restricted VLAN. I go to a restricted VLAN, and then I can be sent to a captive portal where I can actually then go uh, follow some instructions and download and actually put a supplicant software on here, get some credentials, okay? But in the meantime, I'm on a restricted VLAN, and dot .1x and Radius is using a feature called COA, okay? Change of authorization. So once I jump through the hoops, I can change my authorization and get onto the corporate LAN. Or you might just leave me in the restricted VLAN where I'll just go to the internet, okay? Now the iPad Air, which is wireless, I could just put that into the guest VLAN where they go through a URL filtering or a web application firewall and they get kind of guest access to the internet, okay? So I've got all these flexible solutions. What I can also do, let's say the authentication service on the back end includes something like Cisco Identity Service Engine, okay, Cisco ICE. I have a lot of flexibility. I can take that port and I can slap a PACL on it, a port-based ACL, if I want to do that, and I can get control that way. I can force different supplicants into different VLANs. We kind of talked about that. But I can go one step further and I can use security group tagging. And I can actually use a security group ACL configured on Cisco's ICE and I can slap an access control list based on a tag that is gonna be on the frame coming from that supplicant when it leaves that authenticator switch, going to the next switch. And again, as I've already mentioned, I have lots of flexible options for advanced security with EAP. And that would include as well, using things like uh, RSA Secure ID. So don't forget about you know smart cards and biometric capabilities and so, by using diameter and using EAP, I can use .1x PNAC to keep up, because it's extensible, right? So I can keep up with these new methods for advanced authentication and authorization. Next, I wanna switch gears and talk about some of the IP version four to IP version six transitions, because this is definitely advanced networking. And we're gonna look at six options that you need to know for the exam, okay? So let's start with dual stack light, okay? And a lot, of these, a lot of these, I've included the request for comment. If you take a look at the table I've made here for you, I've got the RFCs there as well. So it wouldn't hurt to take some time on your own, maybe just to go up to the RFC, go online, and just kind of look at the brief overview in the beginning. Okay, to kind of maybe get a bigger feel, just in case you get a couple of questions on the exam. So dual stack light or DS light, which is RFC 6333, basically the CPE device, okay, the customer premises device is running both IPv4 and IPv6, and it uses two sets of addresses, hence dual stack. The next option is stateless IP ICMP translation, and this is covered by several RFCs. Stateless IP ICMP translation translates between the packet header formats in IPv6 and IPv4, okay? It uses what's called the SIIT, which is the acronym for stateless IP ICMP translation. Its method defines a class of IPv6 addresses. They're called IPv4 translated addresses. Another popular option is dynamic six to four tunneling. This allows IPv6 entities to connect to other IPv6 locales across an IPv4 backbone automatically. So it applies a unique IPv6 prefix. Moving on, we've got NAT64, couple of RFCs covered here. This allows IPv6 hosts to communicate with IPv4 servers. The NAT64 server 
is the endpoint for at least one IP version 4 address and an IPv6 network segment of 32 bits. The IPv6 client inserts the IPv4 address with what it wants to communicate using these bits, and it sends its packets to the subsequent address. The NAT64 server then generates a NAT mapping between IPv6 and IPv4. Next, we have DNS64. This is a less optimal solution because it only works for cases where DNS is used to find the remote host address. If IPv4 literals are used, the DNS64 server will never be included. And because the DNS64 server needs to return records that are not specified by the domain owner, DNSSEC validation, which is an important feature for security against the root, will fail in lots of situations. And many times we need to use DNSSEC for advanced security. Finally, we have NAT proxy and translation, NATPT. This is a deprecated solution. So along with Teredo and Isotap, which are temporary measures, these are suboptimal and they've been deprecated. And for most environments, we should not use them and we should gravitate towards NAT64 or the other three options I showed you on the first table. The third topic I want to talk about is mesh networking. This is advanced networking, and this is going to work in larger areas like manufacturing. So let's say that Brio has a customer that is a medium-sized manufacturing firm, okay? Maybe they're manufacturing skateboards, okay? I used to skateboard when I was a kid. I've got my broken toe three times to prove it. So let's say they're making skateboards, right? So they've got a larger area with dense walls, multiple floors, they've got metal, they've got concrete substructures. So they went out and leased or purchased an old, really well-built building, okay? And there's other structural impediments. Now, mesh can be used in this situation, but it can also be used outdoor. You know, it's often used outdoor, for example, in amusement parks or city parks or uh, concert venues, okay? The list kind of goes on and on. Uh, where these can be used in outdoor scenarios. Maybe, maybe even in a metropolitan kind of municipality, uh, it can be used outside. Mesh networking utilizes multiband operating in 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz radio using typically uh, .11 AC, okay? Now, the recommendation that I just showed you is to use WPA2, and that is a recommendation, okay? We want to use WPA2 preferably enterprise, and avoid WEP and avoid WPS to kind of auto-configure our endpoints. But realize that there's a recent crack, K-R-A-C-K, to WPA2, where if somebody can get in range, and this is typically the most vulnerable systems are Linux systems and Android systems, but they don't have to even crack the pairwise master key. They're replacing the key. So this is a really dangerous recent attack as of the fall of 2017. So there may be some firmware or software patching that you may have to do on your wireless clients out there because of this new crack attack. Take a look at this diagram that we have here. In this diagram, we've got uh, you know, a wide variety of different devices. Some of these devices are going to be you know, fixed devices. Some of these devices will be mobile devices moving around. So we have a, we have a combination of different types of hardware and, and there's different vendors that specialize uh, in this type of mesh networking. Cisco actually isn't the biggest player in wireless mesh networking. There's some other solutions out there. You might want to investigate those. But you can see here that we actually have a corporate LAN and that corporate LAN also has some wireless devices, uh, wireless printers, surveillance cameras, and there is a device between the corporate LAN, typically a wireless LAN controller, or possibly a multi-layer switch with a module in it. So we have to have something that's bridging between the .11 AC mesh network and the Ethernet network. And that's also an area to be careful of from a security standpoint. So we have to have a really hardened device there and we have to have possibly .1X or other solutions uh, to provide security to make sure that that's not a weak point between this outdoor mesh network where you know we've got a wide variety of users with their mobile devices 
uh, with soft APs that have the capability of getting through that bridge to the corporate land. So that's a dangerous area there. And we have to also spend a lot of time doing analysis, okay, doing Wi-Fi or wireless analysis of the outdoor area so that our antennas and our nodes are placed strategically and that our cells uh, they have, we have nice overlap and we have a uh, scenario where we're not creating any type of interference with other businesses and other, you know, you might have an airport nearby or something like that. So we have to make sure that we have really good wireless analysis done. And again, because of the IoT, uh, the devices that can participate in mesh network can run the gamut. I mean, we're going to start to see people with wearable technology and actually clothing that is participating in a mesh network. And so that brings in, you know, a lot of security and privacy issues as well. So uh, we looked in this particular lesson at three big advanced technologies, and we want to remember that for the exam, dot one X PNAC. Then we looked at transition from IP version four to IP version six, and then finally mesh networking.